I remind you this morning we have a great God. He constantly intercedes to make intercession for us. He knows all about tomorrow. He knows our thoughts. He knows our ways. He's intimately acquainted with them all. Nothing has occurred to him, and yet he bids us to come. That's so precious, isn't it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your eternal presence in this place. We thank you, Lord, that you are Lord of the churches, that you're Lord of this church, and that you're in our midst. And we bless you for the presence of God in our lives and our hearts. Lord, we do not know where we would be except for in this place, because you touched us so many, many years ago. We bless you and thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ, so great a salvation, so great a Savior, uh, so precious of a Savior, the one who has loved us with an everlasting love, uh, the one who is acquainted with all of our ways, who knows all about tomorrow. Uh, you uh, have set your heart uh, in eternity on each and every one of us, and uh, we uh, marvel, uh, we uh, struggle to comprehend, and yet we know it's true. And we, uh, we bless you for your presence, Lord. We bless you for your love, your life, your eternal goodness, and we thank you that uh, we can partake and we can enter in to the Lord Jesus Christ in his life and all the promises of God this morning. Uh, Father, uh, quiet our hearts. Uh, we live in a very distressing and distracted world. Um, our lives are distracted with so many things. Uh, in many respects, we're like Martha. We run here and there, and uh, we don't take the time uh, to sit at your feet. Uh, we're at times burdened with life, uh, burdened with family problems, uh, concerned about finances, and these things are all true because um, it happens when we take our eyes off of you. Uh, may you give us uh, a refocus today. Uh, may you touch us in a way where we know that we've been with you. Uh, may you quiet our hearts. Uh, may we sense your presence and your peace and your joy. Uh, may they overflow in, a, in abundance this hour, this day. May you bring uh, cleansing to our hearts afresh. May, uh, may you give us a repentant heart, um, a heart that doesn't grumble or complain, a heart that is not critical or downcast, uh, a heart that just feeds uh, on the living waters of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I pray uh, that prayer for myself this morning, Lord, and for each and every heart that is in this place. Uh, also, Father, too, for that prayer that extends to uh, those that are shut in. Uh, I think of Fred Legler, Lord, this hour, this day, that you uh, would touch his body, uh, touch his spirit, touch his heart, uh, work wonders in his life and his heart, Lord. I also lift up uh, Patricia this hour, this day. Uh, give her strength and peace in you. Uh, Father, we think of uh, Sandy Sherman uh, with the struggles that she has daily, and yet uh, a woman of great faith uh, who sets her heart upon you. Uh, lift her spirits this hour, this day. Also, Father, too, uh, think of uh, Diana Wynn and the family. Um, thank you, Lord, uh, that uh, Diana knows you. She loves you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that the best is yet to come for her. We pray that you would give her strength and encouragement of heart uh, daily, uh, hope renewed, uh, as only you can do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Also, Father, too, for those things that uh, escape my heart and my mind, uh, you know them. Uh, perfectly, um, all the things that uh, that are on our hearts in this place today, uh, you know them perfectly. 
And uh, we pray that you would give us the grace and the strength to wait upon you. Uh, also, Father, finally, I lift up our country. Uh, we pray that you would raise up leaders that love you, that seek your face, that are acquainted with your ways, uh, that honor the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would raise up Christian business people uh, to, to the highest levels of uh, corporate America. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would uh, raise up leaders in our towns uh, that would speak, uh, even though, uh, even if there were a voice crying in the wilderness, I pray, Lord, that, that they would speak your truth and that they would uh, take a stand for you. Uh, we, we are a needy people in this country. And we have great, great uh, concerns for our country, great, great needs for our country. And uh, we ask and pray uh, that you would raise up leaders to that end. Uh, also, Lord, too, uh, I pray again uh, for a revival uh, to sweep across our country. Uh, may it start in some church, this church, uh, some heart, uh, my heart or some heart that's here. Uh, may you set one of um, your children's hearts ablaze that would be the seeds in the beginning of a revival in this country. Uh, again, we bless you for your presence. We thank you uh, that we can pray to you. Uh, thank you that you constantly live to make intercession for us, and we pray that as we continue to worship, that you would receive our worship, that it would bless your heart. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, we have scripture reading. Uh, Dave? This morning's first reading from the New Testament, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, from the fourth chapter. Be reading verses 17 through 24. And if you're using a red church Bible, that can be found on page 1135. Again, Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Verse 17 through 24. Paul writes, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way you of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. May the Lord add his blessing. Continuing in Paul's writings, the book of Galatians, the second chapter, verses 19 through 21. That can be found on page 1129. Again, the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, on page 1129. Paul writes, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God 
who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And from Paul's letter to the, the second letter to the church at Corinth, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, and that can be found on page 1122 in the church Bible. Again, the second chapter of second book of Corinthians, I'm sorry, fifth chapter, verses 14 and 15. Paul writes again, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Two great scriptures. Uh, pray that God gives us insight into them. Let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, may your Holy Spirit uh, be our teacher and our guide during this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, folks, this morning I've been led to talk about the exchanged life. I've used this term in the past. Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you're a bit familiar with it. Maybe you're totally unfamiliar with it. I have, I have much to say about it, uh, but I'm going to try to keep it short and simplify it. Now, the problem is... Uh, as I started to work on this, the message got longer and longer. <laughs> so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to do this in two parts. Uh, this will be part one today. Uh, the origin of the term of the exchange life was actually coined by Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission back in the 1800s. It, it is associated with a spiritual transformation that he experienced at age 37 in the mission field. And it was only after he experienced tremendous burnout. And instead of holy striving, that is H-O-L-Y, holy striving, trying to be more holy, it was a spiritual transformation that came through holy abiding, W H O. L -L -Y. In other words, abiding in what God has given him, not striving for something other than. And so people marveled at the change that Hudson Taylor experienced. So the results of a changed life, when you think of the term, you want to think of spiritual transformation. Uh, we see this concept actually in fairy tale plots, do we not? Uh, with the various twists and turns, like, for example, the prince and the pauper. Remember, there were lookalikes, and they kind of exchanged roles. The, the prince became the pauper, the pauper became the prince. Uh, a little bit more uh, to current day, you remember the beauty and the beast? You know, you've got uh, the beast who was under the spell of some sort of wicked witch, and uh, he had to find love and kindness in his heart before he actually experienced the transformation. Uh, the story of the Hulk, you know, the Incredible Hulk, you know, was it, uh, when I was growing up, it was a movie by Bill Bixby. Uh, he was the Hulk, but you know, he would drink the portion or the potion, and, uh, but he would uh, turn into this green menacing monster uh, when he got angry. And then you have the classic story of what? Dr. Jekyll and, and Mr. Hyde, right? Another scientist who drinks this potion and has these transformations. Now, all of those fairy tales capitalize on the negative side effects of transformation. But for Hudson Taylor, it was actually experiencing the life of Christ in a whole new dynamic. Now, uh, we'll, we're, I'll talk about his background in a little bit. 
But it was a life-changing spiritual transformation. And, I, you know, and, and I'm talking about this because I think it's something that our churches need today. And I think it's something that we need today. Some refer to it as Hudson's mystical transformation. Now, here's the problem. Anytime you hear the word mystical, it doesn't always foster or have a good connotation. Um, it, it's usually sinky, seeking some sort of religious or spiritual experience apart from Scripture, trying to communicate with the divine, seeking spiritual experiences, uh, maybe you say, outside the body. Uh, for example, Nostradamus was considered a mystic. So it doesn't have a good connotation. But Hudson Taylor was not a spiritual mystic. In keeping it simple, Taylor came to understand the fullness that he had in Christ living right in his life and in his heart. That was the revelation of God to him. And said, so instead of holy striving, be, trying to become holier, he just abided in the life of Christ. So the, the term exchanged life simplifies and brings together many, many concepts in Scripture that are, that are basically plastered all throughout Paul's writings. Uh, it's a term that nicely sums up what Scripture teaches. Uh, that the believer partakes of eternal life, we partake of the life of Christ at the time of the new birth. When Christ became our Savior, you and I became a new creation. That's what Scripture says. Uh, take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, a couple verses down from what Dave wrote. Paul says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature the, or creation. The old things, old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. It's newness in Christ. It's a new identity in Christ. We identify with his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. All of those things we identify with. And what happens is this brings the death of the old man and it brings the life of the new man, the life of Christ to us. Now, here's, here's the thing that you want to understand. This is important. The death of the old man doesn't mean that sin is eradicated. Scripture nowhere teaches that when you come to Christ that you are a sinless human being. Now, God looks down from heaven and sees us as perfect in his son. But the reality is, is when we look in the mirror, we're sinful and we know that we still sin. But we're redeemed. And so how we see ourselves is totally different from how God sees us. This is not, by the way, too, New Age thinking where you... Uh, it, it's like the deification of man. You know, New Age thinking, what they want to do is they want to make man like a god. The exchange life has nothing to do with that. It's essentially understanding and unpacking scriptural truth that the Apostle Paul was led to write by the Holy Spirit. And, and it's finding spiritual transformation in the person of Christ alone. I cannot transform myself. I can't drink some sort of magic potion and, you know, tomorrow be like totally Christ-like. Spiritual transformation, sanctification, is a process that only God himself does through the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you, can, you can jump through all sorts of hoops. You can fast. You can pray. You can... You know, go on a mountaintop and sit there for 60 days. Spiritual transformation only comes when God decides uh, alone in Christ to transform the, his child. So it, it comes through none other. Uh, now, let's simplify it a little bit more because uh, in terms of meaning. 
The exchanged life means that God took our place in death and in life. Now, we recognize that God took our place at the cross, but we often fail to be mindful that he also took our place in life and that we are to let him live through us. We forget that. So, when he was crucified, and you know these things, but we're, 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 we're setting the table... When he was crucified, we were crucified, and so was all of our sin. When he was buried, we were buried with him, and so was all of our sin. When he arose, we arose in him to newness of life. When he ascended, we ascended in him. We are not of this world, as the scripture says. When he sat down, we were also seated with him in all the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You've heard it before, when Christ sat down, he finished his work. If we are seated with him, you and I are a finished work. Romans 8.29 points this out. Let me read that scripture for you. Very familiar, perhaps? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. You have predestined, conformed, called, justified, glorified. It's a finished work. We're a finished work. Romans, all of these truths, by the way, and many of you know the scriptures, all of these truths are mentioned in Paul's epistles. They're the result of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, if you go over there, it combines death, burial, and and resurrection of the believer in Christ. It's attained by grace through faith. That's the essence of the message of Romans. The book of Ephesians combines the resurrection, the ascension, and the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. It's all attained by grace through faith. And let me additionally add this. When you read the Gospels, foundational to the Gospels is the life of Christ. What you have here is his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And all of those acts and all of those events points to the spiritual realities that every believer has in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, that's why we talk about the exchanged life. Now, let me, let me uh, summarize what I think is generally the typical Christian experience. One accepts the testimony of Scripture. One accepts the Lord Jesus by grace through faith. We understand it's by grace. We cannot work for it, right? Amen? But even though subconsciously we have worked for it, we understand faith is a gift, even though at times we applaud those who have great faith, but we have the same God and the same faith, even though we applaud people who have great faith, we come to understand that all of our sin is forgiven, not just some sins, even though we've all still struggled at times to leave our sin at the cross. And then yet, sadly, some also struggle to think that they can lose their salvation. So we come, that's the Christian experience. We come to understand that all of this is made possible because Christ took our place at Calvary. Uh, if you were to read um, theology books, they refer to it as vicarious substitutionary atonement. Vicarious simply means that you can enter into an experience God realized that experience for us, so we don't have to enter into it. Uh, keeping it simple here, he took my place so I don't have to. That's what we say. 
So Jesus realized for us what we will not have to experience. The wrath of God and the judgment of God. He took our place at Calvary. He bore the pain and the punishment so we don't have to. We understand that as believers. He made the sacrifice in death so we could live. We understand that as believers. Uh, we hear of stories of sacrifice all the time, don't we? Uh, some are everyday sacrifices. Uh, some are life sacrifices. Uh, they, they, they're, they're called one and done sacrifices. You give your life for a cause. Uh, for example, uh, Navy SEAL Michael Mansoor, he understood sacrifice. Uh, his life was a sacrifice, it was one and done. In 2006, he threw himself on a grenade in the presence of other SEALs and Iraqi soldiers so they would not die, so that they might live. At his funeral, the scripture was read, greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. One of the soldiers, one of the SEALs that knew Mansoor very well, saw the look in his eye as he made the decision to look at people and look at the grenade and drop on it. He understood sacrifice. Our military understands sacrifice. Parents understand sacrifice. I believe many Christians understand sacrifice. So what I'm saying here this morning is I think we get the death part, don't we? We understand sacrifice. Jesus took our place. I believe Christians, most Christians, get the eternal life part. We understand that, and I hope you understand, you can't lose your salvation. You're a child of God. But, most of us struggle to get the resurrected life part, don't we? It's true. Last, last week, we celebrated Easter, right? Great church holiday reminding us that the tomb is empty. Christ defeated death. We believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. We accept the biblical testimony. We know that there's an empty tomb. We embrace what is written here. We know we will rise again. Like Martha, I know that Lazarus will rise again in the resurrection. I know that I will rise again in the resurrection. I know that you as believers will rise again in the resurrection. We know it. But, we struggle in the between time to live the resurrected part, don't we? What does Paul say here in Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. The, the scriptures that Dave read here, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. We get the death part. And he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. But we struggle to get the resurrection part. And if you think about it, isn't that the most elusive part of the Christian life, the resurrected part. That's where we fall short. That's where Hudson Taylor fell short. Experiencing the resurrected life was at the heart of his spiritual transformation. Uh, some actually called it his Pentecost movement. You know, you read Acts chapter 2 and you hear how God sent the Holy Spirit and, you know, there was... the. the the tremendous outpouring and flames of fire and, and this, uh, some thought that they were drunk. But they had this tremendous spiritual experience. And, and uh, we call it Pentecost. Well, some said that when Hudson Taylor experienced the resurrected life of Christ, it was his Pentecost. Now, let me share some excerpts from his writings and... Uh, prior to this experience because it actually may parallel no I believe it parallels not much of our experience let me give you a little background Hudson Taylor was brought up as a Methodist 
He found the Lord at like 17 or 18 years of age. The Methodists teach, at least they did back then, that works do not save. But works were a big part of the Methodist model. It was a life of do, 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 and more do. And so Hudson Taylor was driven to reach the Chinese people with the gospel. I mean, his heart burned like there was no tomorrow with it. And his drivenness came at great, great expense to his family and himself. He came to the point of a mental and emotional breakdown. He, you know, kind of like when I watch the news today, <laughs> you know, I'm like ready to <laughs> break down, right? Someone wrote this about Taylor, quote, Taylor's physical and mental condition and despair and dissatisfaction of his spiritual condition catapulted his desire for holiness and a deeper way with God. Often sick in body, perplexed by conflicts, rumors, and criticism. Close to breaking point and working without precedent in many respects. He was a pioneer missionary to China. No one was there. Uh, he was faced with the awful temptation to even end his own life. In fact, it was Maria, his wife, who stood between him and suicide. Taylor himself wrote, quote, I felt the need personally and for our mission of more holiness, life, power in our souls. But personal need stood first and was the greatest. I felt the ingratitude, the danger, the sin of not living nearer to God. I prayed, I agonized, I fasted, I strove, I made resolutions, I read the word more diligently. I sought more time for retirement and meditation. But all was without effect. Every day, almost every hour, the consciousness of sin oppressed me. I knew that if I could only abide in Christ, all would be well, but I could not. I began the day with prayer, determined not to take my eye from him for a moment. But pressures of duties, uh, but, but the pressure of duties, sometimes very trying, constant interruptions, apt to be so wearing, often caused me to forget him. Then one's nerves get so fretted in this climate that temptations to irritability, hard thoughts, and sometimes unkind words are all the more difficult to control. One missionary accused him of being a tyrant. Hudson goes on to say, each day brought its register of sin and failure and lack of power. To will was indeed present with me, but how to perform I could not. I, I found not. Then the question came, is there no rescue? Must it be thus to the end, constant conflict and instead of victory, too often defeat? Kind of sounds familiar, huh? Instead of growing stronger, he says, I seem to be getting weaker and to have less power against sin and no wonder for faith and even hope were getting very low. I hated myself. I hated my sin. And yet I gained no strength against it. I felt I was a child of God. His spirit was in my heart. And I would cry out in spite of all this, Abba, Father. But to rise to my privileges as a child, I was utterly powerless. I thought that holiness, practical holiness was to be gradually attained by a diligent use of the means of grace. I felt that there was nothing so much I desired in this world, nothing so much I needed, but so far from in any measure of attaining it, the more I pursued and strove after it, the more it eluded my grasp, till hope almost itself died out. I would not give you the impression that this was the daily experience of all those long weary months, but it was a too frequent state of soul, that toward which I was tending and which almost ended in despair. And yet never 
did Christ seem more precious, a Savior who could and would save such a sinner? And sometimes there were seasons not only of peace, but of joy in the Lord. They were transitory, though. At best, there was a sad lack of power. Oh, how good the Lord was in bringing this conflict to an end. Now, this was the Christianity that Hudson Taylor had learned. This was the Christianity that he pursued. And this is the Christianity that we're all taught, is it not? Always in pursuit of the dangling carrot, right? On the, the carrot's on the stick, and you know, you've seen the cartoons. The, you know, you always keep on walking for it. Trusting self to do, with God's blessing, of course. And you're always chasing the carrot, lacking power. Rather than trusting God to do through the Holy Spirit power that lives within. You know, like Hudson Taylor, I know that Christ is precious to you. That's why you're here. Uh, that's why I'm here. Christ is precious. We want to sense his presence. We want his touch. But we all know about the pressures don't we? And we all know about despair. You know, I'm, I'm kind of wired where I don't worry and get anxious. And yet lately, I feel like myself getting, not worrying, but anxious. I'm thinking, God, where's this coming from? I think we all know about despair and pressure. And I think we all know, too, about peace and joy being transitory, right? You got great, great joy and great peace one moment. The sky could fall and you'd be at peace. And then other times it's like, the sky's falling. We all know that, don't we? And yet, a lack of power often prevails. With my own spiritual experiences, this is how I've negotiated that whole scenario. I, I theologically chalk it up to the human experience. Well, you know, it's the old man rearing its ugly head, and I'm to consider him dead, but it's the old man rearing his ugly head. Or I've said to myself, I'm human. I can't always live on the mountaintop like Moses. I mean, even, even Moses had to come down, right? So I say, Moses came down, I come down too. Or like David. You know, David walked in the valleys of the shadow of death. So I, I got it, God. You know, life has valleys and there's shadows of death, and I'm going to be like David. I say it's part of life. That's what it is, right? And yet there's something that nags within me because I believe and I know that there is a resurrected Christ that lives within me in all of his fullness. And so why is it like this? You know what I'm talking about. How do I know this? Because I've seen others experience it too. Where they've done better at times, like I have, and where they've done really bad at times, like I have. You know, uh, last week I said uh, in, our, in the Easter message, we all have a resurrection testimony, don't we? I know... I, I know that you could stand up here and tell me or tell the church how you met God and how he changed your life and your heart. But I'll bet you that your testimony is oftentimes like Hudson Taylor's. The life of Christ seems to come and go, ebbs and flows. And yet you know too that you have a full resurrected Christ who indwells here too. So why is it that he ebbs and flows and ebbs and flows? The Apostle Paul wrote Philippians chapter 1 verse 21, for to me to live is Christ. If you think about that verse, he was talking about his physical life, but oh, so much more so about how that in his physical life, Christ would live through him. 
you know, um, I, I alluded earlier to Diana Wynn's letter. That was one of the scriptures she put in her letter. For to me to live is Christ, and you know the, the other part, to die is gain. So precious. Diana, if you're listening, uh, you're a woman of great faith. For to me to live is Christ. That's, that was Paul's testimony. That's Diana's testimony. That's our testimony. And, and yet, we see the resurrected life ebb and flow, don't we? Take a look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, well, actually, if you go back to uh, that, that whole section that Dave uh, read this morning, it's interesting uh, if you go and you take a look at verses 19 through 21. And you know a little bit about the book of Galatians, but they, they, they met the resurrected Christ, they received the grace of Christ, and they wanted to go back and live under the law. They wanted to strive after holy things, right? A striving. And Paul says, for through the law I died to the law. Uh, that, Christ died to the law that we might not have to live under it. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself for me. It is no longer I who live. That's what Paul writes. And so, think about it. It's through the death of Christ that we live, but it's in his life that we live the resurrected life. And I think that that's the disconnect. That's where we unplug. We, 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 go, we go to the cross with him and we say, it's substitutionary, it's vicarious, he took my place. And we've died in him, yet, and we've resurrected in him, yet we fail to live out that resurrected life. We fail to make that our own. So, when it comes to the exchanged life part, we've got the death part down. Uh, it sums up nicely in the hymn, Glorious Day, you know, that, that wonderful song, Glorious Day. Let me read the chorus. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, and buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. We've got the death part down. Christ took our place. We have the eternal life part down. Because I know that I'm going to live forever. But we miss the life part. We miss his life part. That's what we do. We fail to appropriate Understanding that he took our place in life as well. On the cross and in life. You know, years ago I was, um, I said it was going to be short, right? It's not short. Years ago I was watching a movie. I can't remember the name of the movie. It was, it, I don't remember that stuff. But I do remember one scene because I was a Christian at the time. One scene stuck out. Stuck out. So, there's this family that sits down at dinner time, and they all get in front of the, you know, their, you know their, 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 they all take their positions at the table. They all bow their head and they say grace, right? And then when they're dumb, done, they're fighting and arguing and swearing and cursing. You know, and of course, that's, that's the classic Hollywood mocking of God in the Christian faith. I, I understand that. I got that. But, it always struck with me because it, I think, underscores or underscored all too, all too often what is commonplace in the Christian life. You know, we know that God died, we pray, we know that the blessing, the food, everything comes, and yet we just lose it at times. And there's, therein lies the struggle of appropriating the resurrected life of Christ. If he took me, my place at Calvary, 
then certainly he took my place in life. And so why is that I, we have that ebb and flow? Now, I'm going to leave it until next week. You say, well, pastor, pastor, tell me, what's the secret? No, you have to come next week. Okay? We're, we'll pick up on Hudson Taylor's experience. Because I think that there is something to it. And I wasn't prepared to get up here and say something today that I wasn't absolutely certain of. But I'm pretty certain of it. But that will be for next week. Now, I'll give you two clues to think on. One was from Hudson Taylor's own testimony. He said, he'll never leave me nor forsake me. That's scripture, right? He'll never leave me nor forsake me. The other clue comes out of our communion hymn. He lives within my heart. That's what we're gonna, what's the song we're going to sing here? Um, he lives. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Those are the two clues to finding the secret of the resurrected life and the exchanged life, and I'll have more to share about that next week. In the meantime, as we, as we come to the table, uh, it speaks of death and life. We've got the death part down. Uh, that's a glorious thing. Christ, Christ has taken our place. We'll talk about the life part next week. Uh, transitioning, 368. 368, uh, we're going to sing our communion song, He Lives. Please stand.